in the minute I get to the top of it. It is amazing because there waiting for me is this welcoming committee. There's so much light and those angels are there in the background. I can see them because they're, they're bigger and more light from them. But there's also my soul family is there. I'm like, oh my gosh. One of my best friends in my life now who's not passed on was there. And I recognize I'm like, oh, that's her higher self. So that made me realize, wait a minute, we can be in a body and be on earth and part of our energy is still up here with the light. Hello, Wendy. A warm welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's such a, a lot of fun to be here. I've watched uh, several uh, videos of you online and I found your life <laughs> quite uh, interesting um, that you went through two near-death experiences while being pregnant and also working as a past uh, life healer, energy healer, working with Brian Weiss. Uh, and when I saw that, I was like, oh, I got to speak with her because for me, my spiritual path started a lot with Brian Weiss and Michael Newton. Oh, and those perfect. books, yeah, it, it sort of started with that reincarnation, you know, the thought of, oh, do we have multiple lives? You know, at the beginning, it was like, is that really possible? But it made so much sense. And they were so credible, both of them. And I know you worked with Brian Weiss. So, so I'm curious to see where this conversation is going to go today. <laughs> But let me start with asking you, uh, you had two near-death experiences and you also met an angel, I know, that really helped you uh, in a moment of real despair um, where it was quite critical. But before this happened, were you spiritual at all? Do you have a religious background like leading up to this? I don't. So that was part of what was so amazing and so life changing for me. So I'll, I'll set the stage quickly. So what was happening was I was pregnant with my second child. And it was 1997, summer of 97. And I was a conservative, hardworking uh, mother, we already had one child. We were, my husband and I were both working full time, very excited about the pregnancy because we'd also lost uh, two children to ectopic pregnancies. And I was a Christian. I believed in God. I believed in Jesus, but didn't have a strong uh, background. It's certainly not in spirituality or understanding energy. Uh, so what happened was very, very surprising to me. Yeah. All right. So, and I know you're all also an author, uh, so you've clearly opened up to this. And that is my experience that after you have NDEs, something like, like your whole life shifts, you are a different person. It, was that yes. the case with you as well? It's absolutely the case. It came by degrees, though. It wasn't this huge change all at once that would come that would come years later. But I think maybe maybe I was being the onion, and it's just I needed a lot of peeling <laughs> to get to the core of what my purpose is and what I came here to do and what I should be doing. So that came that came bit by bit. But definitely the NDEs with with the drama of that and that happening while I was pregnant, that definitely, I think, changed things so much that it helped me prepare to get on my life path. And then that would come, that would come in the coming chapters. <laughs> right. Yeah. But that makes sense. So let's dive into those two NDEs and then we'll, we'll talk after that. Uh, and I'll ask you more questions. So how did this happen? How, um, how long were you on your way when you had your first near death experience? Yes, I was newly pregnant. It was first trimester. I was only 10 weeks pregnant. So I'd had one OBGYN visit. Everything looked great, but I was noticing two things that did not seem um, right to me. And one was I was just having this extreme heartburn, which just seemed odd uh, so early in the pregnancy. So I'd called the doctor's office several times and they said, my land is safe in pregnancy. You can just take that and call us if anything else concerns you. And the other thing was I was having precognitive dreams, very vivid dreams almost every night, but I didn't know 
what to make of it. And I didn't know that you could be having a dream that was trying to tell you something big is coming and trying to uh, foretell um, future events. So what I would dream um, almost every night was this vivid, vivid scene. And it's this big storm out at sea. And I could see this ship and the ship, just everything was ripping and tearing. The masts are falling off. The winches, the cleats are all tearing off. And the ship would always break in two and the ship would go down. Now, it doesn't take a big dream interpreter <laughs> to say, Wendy, your ship's about to go down. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't understand that. I was about to have um, a near-death experience. So I was working at home and my husband's at work. He's got one car. Our nanny's at the park um, with our little toddler. We had an 18 month old with the other car. And I just can't focus. I just don't feel right. So I'm trying to work, but then I keep, uh, it's like, oh, I have to go lay down. I just, I don't feel right. And I found I was like kind of clutching my middle. And then I ran into the bathroom at a certain point because I had this sense of just imminent doom and I just felt like, oh my gosh, something is really, really wrong. Oh, how neat. My plant light went out right when I said that. (laughs) (laughs) So I run into the bathroom again thinking, oh, I'm going to be sick. Something's really wrong. And it felt like I looked down in puzzlement because it felt like someone had stuck a knife in my abdomen. There just was this searing pain and I felt like something tore open. And kind of my last thought was, oh my God, I need help. I'm going down, I'm going down. And I could picture that that ship again. And I also kind of like the last conscious thought was, I think an organ just burst. It's all, it's all I could think of. So I pass out on the floor of the bathroom. I'm home alone. I don't know how long I was unconscious. The reason I came back Uh, The reason I came to was there was this just insistent male voice that kept saying, Wendy, Wendy, you've got to wake up now. You've got to call for help now or you're going to go home. And I knew exactly what that meant. I knew I was going to die. So I'm like opening my eyes thinking, who is talking to me? And I open my eyes. I'm laying on my side in the bathroom And the room has so much light in it. I have never seen so much light. And there were these four or five really large figures with just so much light coming off them. I couldn't see faces clearly at all. And I just was so astonished because it's like, oh my gosh, my bathroom is filled with angels. I knew they were angels. They were so large, so loving, so much light, so much energy coming from them. And I could see that they were floating a few inches off the floor. And I just got this sense of these mighty, huge wings. And I could sense that they were like curling up behind where their feet would be because the the wings were so long. So that's what, that's what um, kicked off these amazing events And my answer, because again, I'm hearing, you've got to call for help now. And my answer was, I I understand, but I I can't walk. I I don't know how to get to the phone because I was just in so much pain, just, you know, uh, just clutching my middle and just curled up in a fetal position. And his answer, again, was very telling. And he said, you just have to be willing to try. And I think what that was about was free will, because yes, I had asked for help as I was going down. I cried out for help. And so what I did was I, it took me a couple tries, but I managed to get up on my hands and knees. And at that point, again, just belief systems are just being blown wide open because it's like being gently lifted or flown to the landline that was on the nightstand just you know right next to the bathroom because I was in the the master suite and uh, my brain's trying to catch up like okay I don't know how I just got here but just say thank you just say thank you and I reached up and I managed to to grab the phone because I'm still on the floor 
And I did have a quick thought of, oh gosh, the angel didn't say who to call. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and call my husband at work. I didn't even think to call 911, didn't enter my mind. I'd never called 911. I'm a 36 year old healthy woman. I've never called 911. And I called my husband. Miracles continued because he answered immediately on the first ring. I have never reached him at work. <laughs> it was always voicemail. So that was a big deal. And I give him a lot of credit because all I said to him was, I need you to drive me to the hospital now. Can you come home immediately? And he didn't say anything other than on my way. And I could hear him throw the phone down. So there was no, there was no 20 questions. <laughs> and I just had enough time to call the OBGYN office, tell them what was happening. They asked me a few questions. I answered them. They said, that's great. Your husband's on the way. He's going to get you here quicker than calling 911 at this point. We're going to meet you curbside with a wheelchair. Don't park your car. Just we're going to meet you right there. And we're going to get you, we're going to get you help. So that's exactly what we did. We drove to the OBGYN office. They were located at the hospital. And I think that was perfect also for me. There was just was so much assistance for me. So I get taken up to the uh, OB office and they take me straight into an ultrasound room. They try and do an ultrasound, but just can't get any, any picture. And I'm thinking, is the machine on? Is the machine working? What's going on here? Because I've had ultrasounds before. I mean, you can see all kinds of things. And I, um, I'm looking at my husband. I'm looking at the ultrasonographer. I finally said to her, is that machine working? Is that on? And she said, I'm going to go get the doctor now. I'll be right back. So I'm looking at my husband and we're both like, this is not good. Um, and she returns almost immediately with not only a physician, but with a certified nurse midwife. And that was a bit comical because we've now got five of us squeezed into this tiny ultrasound room. So the physician makes an adjustment to the machine and he realizes what's happening. And he just tells me, you know, very kindly, very calmly, Wendy, um, we aren't able to see anything. What, what you're seeing is accurate. What you're seeing, all that black that you're seeing on the screen, that's blood loss. You've got a huge, you've got a tremendous blood loss going on in your abdomen right now. I don't know where it's coming from. We need to get you up into the hospital right now. So um, I get whisked uh, via stretcher um, onto the floors and admitted uh, bedside straight, straight into the hospital. So I'm now up on the GYN floor and it's all happening really fast. I noticed I was right next to the nurse's station. So I knew, I knew they were concerned about me. They asked me my blood type and I said, sure, I, I know my blood type. I think everyone should know their blood type and just get one of the free, in case of emergency, um, apps for your phone. And then if you're ever in a critical situation, 911 can access it on your phone without knowing your passcode. And you can put in your blood type, any allergies, medications, anything. I have instructions in there how to find my dog and, you know, get to my dog at home and feed my dog. <laughs> Mark, oh, yeah. You know, because if you can't talk, you need, you need to be able to convey certain information, particularly if you live alone. Yeah. So they're trying to um, get, get blood for me. They're calling the Puget Sound Blood Bank, uh, which is a central uh, blood bank so that that precious resource is not wasted. Um, is how it's done in the Seattle area. And the nurse comes in and she does not look happy. And she says, I can't get any blood for her because there was evidently a major train collision a few days before, and it had wiped out the supply of A negative. So for whatever reason, um, they didn't they didn't infuse me with just, you know, the O, the O positive or whatever, the universal. They just didn't do that. They said, okay, we're gonna wait and watch. They talked about doing surgery right away. But we don't know what we're operating on. We don't know what's going on. We don't have blood for me that's that's a match. So the instructions were, okay, just you're just going to stay in bed. You can't get up even to go to the bathroom. You're going to need to call a nurse for, for a bedpan. And we're just going to take really good care of you, and we're going to figure out what's going on. So that's what kicked off the events. Um, questions? 
not really. I'm I'm more curious about what happens okay. now. Next, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> now it starts, I think. Okay. So what happens next is they do get uh, blood for me and start transfusing me about six or seven um, hours later. And I am just trying to visualize a good outcome, but I am in so much pain. I'm just blowing through um, the Demerol. I'm on morphine. I'm still in so much pain. I do and have I'm... a question though. Yes. Because uh, you did hear an angel. Uh, and obviously you are dead scared right now and what's going on, but you did hear that angel. Did that soothe you? Did you feel like everything is going to be okay since I heard this? Not voice? yet. That's a fantastic question. Not yet. That only got me to the point of knowing to try and visualize a good outcome, but I sure was not experiencing it those first few days in the hospital. So what happened next was they're doing um, hematocrit um, every morning and other, other blood work uh, to see how I'm doing. I'm being very closely monitored, but my hematocrit is just falling, falling, falling. And I can see they're hanging bag after bag of blood. I know I'm going through it really quickly. And I also knew I had the sense I was walking between worlds mm. because it was very hard to stay conscious and it was what concerned me, and this was so different than my normal personality, because I've always been a go-getter, a little figure it out, like a can-do kind of person. And what scared me was I didn't really care. Mm. And that that bothered me because it's just, it's just, I was, I was, I was bleeding out. So they told me that, um, my physician told me that on the third day, Wendy got to do surgery because we are bleeding out. We can't transfuse quickly enough, so we need to do surgery. So I agreed to the surgery. The surgery was going to be the next morning, first surgery of the day. And uh, I have my, my dinner that night. I'm alone in my hospital room and... I just was trying to visualize a great outcome because I did have some relief that at least the decision had been made. Surgery made the most sense at this point because, you know, that had been a question for the last the last few days. The minute I visualize a great outcome, I immediately leave my body. I pop right out of it. What a relief. No more pain. I feel more like myself. I look back over my shoulder. I see myself, myself meaning Wendy in the bed, but I'm like, ah, uh, she's, she, she's just, she's a hot mess. I can see that. She's whiter than the sheets. Her hair, she looks like a wild woman, but I really don't care. I need to go up to the light because all I could see was all this light flooding in from the ceiling of the hospital room. And then I'm like, wait a minute, I'm referring to myself in the third person. I've never done that before. Why am I calling myself she? So I realized, well, Wendy's an aspect of me, but she's just, that's just one body. That's just one incarnation. So things were starting to make a lot more sense to me. I had a much bigger worldview, which I'd never had before consciously. But again, I'm like, ah, she's all right. Very blase <laughs> about this, this poor body. And I just follow the light up. So I go up and up and up. I burst right through uh, the ceiling um, of not only the room, but um, of the hospital. And I'm going faster and faster. And I'm looking down going, oh, it's so beautiful. So it's like this Google Earth view of just this gorgeous mm -hmm. scenery below me. But again, I don't really care because I am so focused on that light above. And I can feel uh, the pull, the pull to that. But then at a certain point, again, it was like I ran out of gas. I just didn't have enough energy. I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope they don't make me walk through that tunnel because I don't think I have enough energy to get through the tunnel. I just want to get home. And the minute I thought that and asked for help and said, I don't think I have enough energy to get there on my own, this beautiful escalator comes in right <laughs> of me it like drops down you get exactly what you need it's pristine so much light from this escalator i'm like oh i can catch a ride thank you 
So I plop onto the escalator and I now get a better sense of what my, my form is. And cause I'm like, I'm like a pancake. I'm like a pancake, like hanging over the rail on the escalator, <laughs> on the up escalator. And I'm like, oh. Oh, I'm supposed to be like a, like a beach ball. I'm supposed to be like all like so much energy and be this like round, big orb. And I'm flatter than a pancake. So I ride up on the escalator in the minute I get to the top of it. It is amazing. One of the best experiences of my life because they're waiting for me is this welcoming committee there's so much light. I feel so fantastic to not be in pain and worrying anymore. And those angels are there in the background. I can see them because they're, they're bigger and more light from them. But there's also my soul family is there. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's all my grandparents. And that made me go, oh, that's interesting. Because I knew my mom's parents really well, but my dad's parents had died before I was born. So I'd never met them, but I recognized them immediately. You just know the energy signature, you know, the soul signature. So the grandparents are there. One of my best friends in my life now, who's not passed on, was there. And I recognized I'm like, oh, that's her higher self. So that made me realize, wait a minute. We can be in a body and be on earth and part of our energy is still up here with the light. So that was really cool. And as I get up there, everyone just gives me this big group hug. I could have stayed in that hug forever because it was unconditional love. And we don't feel that very often. And we've got to learn how to give it to ourselves, which I think perhaps has been part of your journey to learn that that self-love, that self-acceptance and to just be kind to ourselves because we're so hard on ourselves often we're so just judgmental and critical of ourselves and we just um, tie ourselves up in knots um, when it's not not necessary so i'm getting this amazing amazing hug and the angel archangel michael i now recognize i'm like oh these are the same angels that were in my bathroom and he says to me welcome home we're so glad you're here. You've done nothing wrong. You're welcome to stay. You have the choice. So let me tell you what I can tell you because you're going to need to decide quickly. And then I kind of flashed back on that not doing very well body in the hospital bed. I'm like, oh, yeah, I get what he means. Um, so what he tells me is I can tell you three things. Number one, if you choose to go back, you will have a successful surgery tomorrow. You will regain your health completely. So I'm like, oh my gosh, this is huge. Number two, your baby will be born healthy. Again, this is huge because I've not only had the NDEs, but morphine, blood transfusions, all in the first trimester of pregnancy. I mean, I am really worried about this. So to be told that my baby would be born healthy was huge. So this is all great and fantastic. Yes, doesn't this make you want to go back? But number three was the zinger. It was, he said to me very clearly, your life is going to be very difficult, likely for many years, because you're not on your life path. So when he said that to me, I was just horrified. I was like, oh my goodness. I was so upset. I'm chagrined. I'm just embarrassed. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to be doing that I'm not doing? Or what am I not supposed to be doing that I'm doing? So I'm looking at him. I'm like, what's my life path? You know, what's my purpose? Please tell me. I, I will absolutely do it. And he just shakes his head really gently. And I'm like, oh, no more information. And so I look around in the group because I think, okay, fine. Archangel Michael doesn't choose to enlighten me, but I've got my whole Sam soul family here. There's other people. There's about 20 souls here plus the angels. I thought there's got to be a chatty Kathy in the group. Someone's got to tell me. So I'm looking all around at all of them. Like, tell me, tell me my life path. Tell me my purpose. But um, 
no one would tell me. And I kind of started to deflate again. So they started being silly because humor, it's just the best way to raise our vibration and keep our trying to keep that sense of humor. It really is a great coping strategy for life. So they start like uh, putting duct tape over their mouths. They start like throwing the key away. They like lock their lips and throw the key away. So I laugh and I'm like, okay, I get it. No one's supposed to tell me. I'm supposed to learn it for myself. I have to do my own work. So I choose to just be really grateful for this experience and for what I was told and for being given that huge, that huge, huge hug that I got and being able to see the light again. So Michael, Archangel Michael now says to me, what do you want to do? You need to choose now. So uh, the minute he asked me that, all I could see was my daughter, my oldest daughter, Tara's adorable little face as an 18 month old. And it wasn't just seeing her face like normal size. It was like the IMAX screen, like the 70 foot, like it filled my world to think about, I could go back and be her mother. And I was also going to regain my health and I was gonna have a healthy second child and the rest of it, I was just gonna have to suck it up and figure it out. So I looked at him, I said, put me back in coach, uh, put me back in, <laughs> you know, I'm ready to, to live at a more, at a deeper level. So I get another hug from the whole group because they are so excited and they're just cheering for me that I'm making the, the decision to go back. And that time I realized the hug, it wasn't just unconditional love. It was energy because as I said, I was just flatter than a pancake. I mean, I just, I just, I didn't have any life force energy left. I just, there just really was nothing left. I don't think I would have survived the surgery the next day without that trip home and without getting that energy infusion. I think that's very much what the ND was about as well as other things it would set up. So I go back down, I get that hug and I'm just waving to everybody. I go back down on the escalator. I'm looking over my shoulder and I just keep waving and they're cheerleading and they're like, you know, having a party and saying, you can do it. We believe in you. So I just float very gently back down through the ceiling and I see my body and I just go plop right back into the body. It was uh, easy to do, but then it was like, uh, wow this body's little and this body's in so much pain, but it's like, okay, Wendy, you got to hold on because you're going to have a successful surgery tomorrow. And then I could so specifically visualize and tell myself, you're going to regain your health. Your baby's going to be born healthy and you're going to figure the rest out. So that's what happened. Um, so I did have a successful surgery. What they discovered was the fundus um, had ruptured. The fundus is an aorta at the top of the uterus. So that's why I had lost so much blood because an aorta was just pumping out, pumping out blood. And they estimated I lost um, approximately three quarters of my blood supply. Um, so obviously I was very fortunate to have gotten um, medical care so quickly, such great medical care, and that I was being um, transfused. That's what, that's what happened. Yeah, quite, uh, quite an NDE there. Um, I find it fascinating that you had premonitions in precognitive dreams, in your dreams, because that means that on a level you were supposed to go through this. Uh, I find that very interesting. And it feels like almost it's part of your purpose and part, part of your life. That's what I've heard from other NDE experiencers that uh, they actually agreed to go through this. Uh, and then we can argue, well, why do you have a choice then to go back or to stay if it's part of your purpose? But maybe that's also part of the purpose that you were to make that choice, you know, to, to grow from it. And what I'm also curious about is that they told you you're not on purpose. 
um because that's uh, that must have been like a shocking it was a shock disturbing, yeah message to get I, and what is my purpose tell me and it's like uh, no you, you <laughs> want to know. it's like uh that that is interesting and then i'm wondering because this is my theory that we feel if we're not on purpose we know if we're lying to ourselves we know that deep inside i, I yearn to do this or express this or have this blossom out in me but i'm not doing it now was that your feeling that i'm not living uh in my truth or were you feeling like you know i'm living a happy life i'm where i should be and what i should do something else I found it, I found it shocking. I had a sense there was more, but I didn't know what more was. And yet yeah, really, it really was a big, it really was a big eye opener. And I felt, I didn't know very much about NDEs at all, because again, this was 1997. So it's 25 years ago. Not many videos on YouTube or... Right, you, exactly. You don't you don't get in there and yeah. go, you know, repeating dream, vivid dream, you know, even without knowing the term precognitive dream or, or prophetic dream, just you know, you can Google almost anything now because you just have to just kind of ground yourself, take a couple of breaths. I call it Googling with the guides. Uh, you know, so that you don't go down this rabbit hole of 50 things that are the wrong information for you. I just take a breath and just say, if you'd like me to Google, please show me on the first hit. I'm going to read one hit only. And I just, <laughs> like I said, Google with the guides um, and just get get information that way as you need to. But I felt really respected and so loved that I was given a choice because when I did learn about uh, and start to study NDEs years later, so many people say, oh, I was just shoved back into my body or told it's not your time. You got to get back in there. And they feel like they were more um, just not given a choice and more slammed into their body. And I didn't, I didn't have that experience. I felt, I felt very grateful for that. I but think about that, that some are saying like, I came back to this yucky body and that uh, you were just like, Oh, I just you know, came back to my body. Like, but it was feeling that great, but it was, didn't seem like it was a shock and that right. it was like a nasty flesh or something like, right. 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 Cause I, cause I knew, cause I made, I made the choice and I just I felt like I had more support and more of a team than I had ever felt before. Cause I had not felt that connection uh, with the, with the divine before. And I'd not felt that unconditional love that had not been my experience. Um, so that really, it gave me like a resource. It gave me a well to, to pull from that hadn't been there before. But what, what happened in the 3D world, the, the daily life world, is I go back to work um, six weeks later. It's a job I love. I go part-time for the first two weeks and then back to full-time. And I worked for a busy uh, ambulatory surgery center. I was the marketing director for an ophthalmology center. So, you know, I pass people in the hall and they're like, oh, Wendy, we're so glad you're back. We knew you were out and that you were really ill and are you okay? What's going on? And I'm like, I just had no words. I just did. I would just say, you know, I'm fine. Glad to be back. I had no words. I didn't talk about the NDE for almost 20 years. Oh, wow. Because I just, I didn't know how to language it. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't think medical personnel um, would, would, know how to process it either. And I was alone when the different things had, had happened. I mean, sure, I had some conversation with my husband because he had to scoop me up and get me off to the hospital. But again, I didn't really know what to say. And interestingly, I think he was more traumatized by the experience than I was because he didn't have the benefit of going home. He didn't have the benefit of right. the interactions with the angels like I did. And I just, again, I didn't know who to, I didn't know who to share it with. That is so ironic because I lived in Seattle at the time and Seattle is home to IANS, 
uh, the International Association of Near Death Studies oldest chapter in the world in the uh, country in the US which is more than 40 years old so they'd already been going for a good 15 years <laughs> but i just i just didn't know about them so evidently i was meant to process it myself and uh, you know live life um, with a lot of with a lot of stumbling and a lot of um, pain and a lot of mid course corrections um, until i did start to get on my path Right. Yeah. It seems like, I mean, even though you had an NDE, it's not like everything comes down in your lap and uh, gets sorted out because you're still human and you still need to take every step and evolve, uh, which makes sense, right? Um, Absolutely. But yeah. Moving back to the NDE, I find it interesting that you met your soul family and also I think you said soul group. And I'm curious about that soul family because how long back are we connected to our soul family like you said you know you met uh people in your family you've never met in your life because you weren't born and i'm thinking that as well like okay so how big is my family i mean it can go back in generations forever and going all the way back we're one right <laughs> right those are great so questions and i think i was using the term soul family and soul group a bit interchangeably okay. so Family to me, I more think of um, ancestral line, but soul family, we make our family, you know, family can be best friends because a lot of people uh, choose, um, choose uh, parents, siblings, whomever, where it's going to be really challenging. Uh, you know, so we can we can make those those uh, best friends who are we're more we're more aligned with because it may not be that birth family. Um, soul group. I see soul group as being people that we work with the higher self. We may meet them in this life, but we may not meet all of them. We may meet none of them. Uh, you know, because we need to be learn to be really independent. So people have very different experiences. I do believe we as souls choose to incarnate many places. Uh, many, many timelines can be on planet, off planet, other dimensions. It's choice. It's free will. But I believe our souls are just incredibly intrepid and just, you know, got the superhero capes on and do this, do this pre-life planning of, gosh, I know I'm not especially good at forgiveness. That doesn't come easily to me. So I'm going to choose some experiences where I'm going to really struggle to forgive another person, forgive a circumstance, forgive whomever so that I get better at it. Or we might be um, choosing to balance up karma. I don't see karma as punishment. I see it as unbalanced energy where there's a teachable moment and there's an energy that's going to bubble back up again. If so I may, is that then karma within the soul group? Do you only work? No, you said you didn't only work with your soul group. Well, we meet, we meet certainly many more people than those in our, in our soul group um, or our soul family. I mean, you, you and I both probably know a thousand people or more, you know, it's just, they're, they're not all in, in our immediate either soul family or soul group that we work with lifetime after lifetime after lifetime and right. do some of this pre-life planning with like we do with our guides and with our elders that are going to help us figure out well, what would be a good way to script you learning to easily forgive and then to get to the final place of there really isn't anything to forgive at all that we're all one and you just don't even need to think about forgiveness because it's just natural it's like oh okay that happened that didn't work for me i don't need to be aligned with that i can just do my thing and just not get my feathers all in a ruffle you know <laughs> so just just progressing um along the way so um i do think that there's there's important people that we choose we're going to meet and i did meet a soulmate uh, meaning someone i've had many many experiences with, I did later meet um, a soulmate that really helped get me on my path. But what happened in between was I'm back at work 
uh, you know, as I said, pregnant, got the toddler and uh, everything looks great to be back to work. But very quickly, I get laid off. And that is a big deal because I carried the health insurance for the family. And in the U.S., most health insurance is employer based. So we have many, many people that do not have health insurance. That's a big issue. So here I am pregnant, no health insurance, um, and also we don't have my income. And also I am very visibly pregnant, not your favorite time to be interviewing. <laughs> so uh, this is challenging. It's very challenging. One week to the day after I get laid off, my husband's company goes down. Oh, wow. He's now working payless paydays. And when he comes home and tells me this, that he's going to be working very long days because he's an owner in the company, he needs to, they need to do so many things. You know, what do we do about our lease? What do we do to take care of the employees we've had to lay off? What do we do to finish the contracts that are not complete? How do we sell the company? So he lets me know he's going to be working 80 to 100 hour weeks and there will be no paycheck. And I'm still going, payless payday, payless payday does not compute. What does that mean? <laughs> You have to slow it down and say that to me again. And I was able to take a breath when he told me that. I said, I'm so sorry, because it's one thing to be laid off from a job, but it's another thing to lose your company, to have your company go down and to lose your baby that way. Mm -hmm. So I was able to say to him, I'm so sorry. You know, we'll figure it out. Just take the weekend off. And Monday, you know, you can file for unemployment and we'll figure it out. And then he's like, Wendy, I don't get unemployment. I was self-employed. There's no unemployment insurance for me. So I'm like, oh my gosh. And we had uh, moved not long before. We'd purchased a larger home. We'd purchased a minivan because second baby on the way. Um, we had a full-time nanny who, because we're both working full-time, she's on contract. It's like, oh my goodness. So the financial... Uh, Engine certainly stopped running, um, so it was it was super super challenging. I did um, go through um, a divorce about six years later. Um, I was home from the hospital literally the day after giving birth, and Archangel Michael came back in and said, oh. "Your contract with your husband is complete." Oh, really? This was not news I wanted to hear. Oh. I knew exactly what he meant and I'm like really you tell me this after I just had a second baby really and I learned later that my contract with my former husband was to have a long-term marriage that we would both learn from and grow from and to have beautiful children together children plural second baby so we divorce uh, when the children are six and eight and fast forward again, about six years later than that, when I am ready to meet um, a great guy and my daughters are now 12 and 14, that's when the soulmate comes in who has me step into my power fully because that was the contract was for him to wake me up spiritually. So that's when things start to really fast forward and I finally get on my track. Um, wow. Wow. Or in their early teens. So th this soulmate, was that, uh, became your boyfriend, your husband, or was it a friend or? He became my, um, uh, my boyfriend. He became my, my lover. I thought we were to marry, um, and that did not, um, work out. We had some very incredibly powerful soul contracts, as I said, wake me up spiritually and also the next contract was to break my heart repeatedly until I stood in my power fully without abusing it. That's what changed everything. And we did break up um, after, after a year. Uh, I was devastated because I also understood we were meant to help other people wake up spiritually. We were meant to do radio together. We were meant to write books together. We were meant to be on television. And he had so much more of that background than me. I didn't have that background at all. I'm still going, how do you turn the microphone on? You know, <laughs> what, what do I do with my backdrop? 
it and it, and he was he had become a sportscaster and you know so it was like oh my gosh so it felt like everything was falling apart again just when it was coming together um and that really was heartbreaking for me but um when it's supposed to be your path guess what your brilliant higher self and guides they'll just find other ways to make it all come back together again so i ended up helping him get his first book published and he becomes the client in my first book and graciously says go ahead publish it all you don't have to change anything um you just you do it with my full support you know, obviously identity blinded just you you go ahead i'm supposed to help you get these published so go ahead and he also coached me because i had a crippling fear of public speaking so i couldn't fulfill my destiny if i couldn't see the audience i just could not I could not deal with it. I would, I would actually physically get sick. I would just lose my voice. I would be, I would be actually sick because it was so much past life energy coming up that I needed to heal of where I had been punished, um, put to death, tortured, family tortured for. Sorry, what are you speaking about now? Past lives is moving a bit too fast. I'm, I'm trying to follow. So uh, you said that you uh, started healing past lives. How did you get over past lives? The way it came up was that same um, soulmate um, boyfriend, he was actively on the spiritual path. He introduced me to Journey of Souls. He introduced me to the concept of past life regression because he was getting ready to go for his second Life Between Lives session, which is a four hour, very deep um, hypnotherapy where you go back in utero, you learn why you chose your life, you learn why you chose your parents, what lessons you set up, and you learn so many things because you journey home uh, during this, this spiritual uh, regression that Michael Newton um, created called Life Between Lives. Um, so he was kind of my fast track because I thought it was fascinating. So he's just giving me book titles right and left. I'm reading them faster than he can read them. And it just, that just really got me on the path I was meant to get on. So he finds the first hypnotherapist for me. I go, I think, oh, I may not get anything because I'm thinking, gosh, I am so uh, filled with anxiety. I don't have, I don't meditate. I don't have any spiritual practice. I'm so type A. I don't know if I'm going to get a darn thing, but I'm so drawn to it. I just have to try. I just have to try. I need to save the money and plunk down that money and go have that past life regression and see what happens. So what happened was I took to it as the client, like a duck to water. And it was profound. In that first two-hour session, I had two past lives come through in a lot of detail that needed a lot of healing. I also cleaned up scenes earlier in this lifetime. And the biggest boon of all, I released anxiety. Uh, there I was at 49, 50 years of age. I'd had anxiety most of my life. I'd had a lot of chronic physical pain a lot of stuck energy from just not being on my path. And it just was gone. It was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So I said to that Newton um, hypnotherapist, please sign me up for the life between lives. I know I'm supposed to have a life between lives. So we signed, um, I, I booked a date with her for one year out because I knew I was supposed to have some other experiences and learn some other things in the interim. And I did. And so a lot more uh, started coming in to prepare me to have that session. Uh, the Life Between Lives was amazing as a client. It was life-changing. I actually transcribed my recording because I love having the recording because you can go back and listen to it. You get a lot more realizations. You get a lot more information about yourself, your soul's journey, your past lives, whatever you most need about how to heal. When I transcribed it and typed it up, it was 65 pages of information I had not known of me speaking as my higher self, of my guides counseling me. And I didn't have access to that um, on a daily basis in my everyday, because um, I didn't meditate. I didn't know how to 
calm my mind. I didn't know how to calm down my energy. So in the beginning, I needed those sessions to help me access it. So uh, I have those two sessions um, in a year, one past life regression, one life between lives. And the next summer, I have um, a quantum healing hypnotherapy session. Uh, so the Dolores Cannon uh, method, again, more and more past lives. So they're now coming to me spontaneously. They're coming in dreams. People are walking up to me and telling me about them. There were so many of them coming through so fast. It was really hard to make order of them. It was really hard to heal them. So I started getting some training. I trained as a Reiki master. I started training as a spiritual teacher because I just needed help because it was like the ocean was just coming in on me so fast. But um, And I could see by the time I had the next quantum healing session, uh, one one year later, I had two um, that summer. So I'd now had a total of one past life regression, one LBL and three quantum healing. The therapist said to me after that session, do you know you're doing both parts? Do you know that you're telling me, ask her this, direct her this? She said, you're, 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 you're clearly some sort of therapist. You're clearly some sort of teacher. And I was like, what? And then when I listened to the tape, I could see she was right. So at that point, it's like, oh my goodness, I'm meant to train to become a past life regressionist. So that's how I then reached out to a Dolores Cannon student and trained for QHHT, quantum healing hypnotherapy, and then trained with Dr. Weiss and then trained with a Dr. Newton student. Wow. And finally you were on your life path. And had the tools and had learned how to quiet down the monkey mind. I've had my MBA degree since I was 22. So it was very left-brained. And as I said, no, no spiritual practice. A lot of uh, physical issues, a lot of chronic pain, a lot of stuck energy. And learning how to clean and clear that all up gives me such empathy for clients. All right. But that makes so much sense because you cannot be a really great teacher or spiritual teacher, at least, if you haven't been through darkness and hard times and challenges. You need to have some experience with that. Otherwise, you cannot recognize it in other people. (laughs) You can't have it be theory. You have to be flattened. Right. Be run over by the truck. Um, and for me, it took it took several times. You know, it took mm-hmm. it took that marriage ending. It took the various health crises. It took multiple uh, job layoffs that just took me to my knees financially. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it took um, the heartbreak of losing that soulmate and having it not work out as a romantic relationship. When I thought, I Finally. mean. I really thought this is the one I really thought that. And he was, but in a different way than I thought. And that's okay too. So you didn't, sorry. You just have to have grace with it. You have to have a sense of humor. (laughs) So you didn't see him in your near death experience in your soul family. I did not. He's actually in an adjacent soul group. We've had many lives together. When I went home in the Life Between Lives session, I immediately found him because after I'd worked with the uh, primary soul group in the Council of Elders, the therapist asked me, she said, look around, see if there's any other souls that you uh, need to clean things up with or need to have a conversation with. And I immediately, I said, oh my gosh, at my two o'clock, I see another soul group where uh, my former boyfriend is and I see him, I see his mother. I've had many lives with his mother. Um, She's been my sister so many times. And I just, you know, I could see other soul groups too that were adjacent to mine. Hmm. Um, I mean, your story is fascinating in that sense that don't give up, you know, like I I believe there's so many people looking for their purpose, not understanding the red thread in their lives. Does it make sense? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? And it took you a long time, like even two NDEs, you would assume that you would get answers in the NDEs, but you had to go through so much after that absolutely when it comes together and i I felt that in my life that 
especially in my private lives, uh, life, <laughs> that uh, things have taken such a long time before it finally came together. Uh, and I believe that patience might be, you know, one of the things I'm going to learn about, one of my soul themes. So it is just, you know, a testament to be patient, trust the divine. There is a plan with our lives. There is a purpose. And if it's not, if you're not there yet, it will come. You're just not there yet, but it right. will come. I Absolutely. Really I think that's so, so important. And yes, that, that thrashing about uh, those challenging experiences, they really, they really, really were necessary because uh, they, they taught me so much. And I also know to really enjoy, to just so be grateful for, you know, enjoying the, the beautiful times and just enjoy every walk with the dog and just being mm -hmm. out in nature, enjoy every wonderful meal, you know, that you get to make, enjoy growing your flowers, your plants, you know, enjoy your family, your friends, music, just whatever you enjoy, just really feel those moments and just take them into your, into your system. And you just, you just enjoy them more. Yeah. Uh, it, it helps nice. us with the challenging times. Yeah, for sure. And that leads me over to uh, the questions I ask my uh, guests. Uh, what is self-love to you? Self-love to me is just that quiet acceptance of yourself as your best friend and accepting your body as just this beautiful, imperfect vessel and vehicle i think you've just got to got to do that to lucille ball said uh, something about love yourself first and everything else will fall into place because look at all she accomplished i mean she was amazing to be a female studio owner in her time uh, that was really unusual um, she wasn't just you know this outrageous comedian comedic talent Right. And what is happiness to you? Pardon? What is happiness to what you? Is happiness. Oh, happiness to me. It's just so interwoven with self-love and with freedom to just feel that you have so much freedom. And we think we just, we get so caught up in our brain. We're thinking, thinking, thinking we're doing. We so often are just caught up in being human doings where we're overscheduled, overstructured, too much on the to-do list, and just really need to tear those up mm -hmm. the best we can because they don't, they don't make us happy. We're not here to be performance monkeys. You know, no one's going to say, oh my gosh, you did 10 million things while you were there. It's like, did you slow down? Did you take care of yourself? Were you kind? Were you kind and loving to everyone that you met to the best of your ability um or again you know if they're not if they're not meant um <laughs> see my dog yeah, <laughs> yeah. around on that one um you know these conversations always attract dogs <laughs> cats, and animals <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah beautiful and the last question uh what is the deeper meaning of life from your perspective I think the deeper meaning of life is to just be yourself and just be fully comfortable being yourself, you know, as goofy as you may be, as flawed as you may think you, you are, we're, we're all a spark of the divine. We're all an aspect of the divine and the divine just doesn't make mistakes. It's just, we don't always understand what's going on because we're in this, you know, little human body in this, you know, kind of in this little um, moment in time. So we just have to surrender. I think the more we can do to spiritually surrender and just say, my goodness, that's just above my pay grade. There must be a reason for it. I just need to let this go. Um, and just to not be, not be, um, so hard on ourselves. Hmm. Beautiful. Where can people find you, Wendy? Uh, via my website, uh, which is wendyrosewilliams.com. And you're welcome to reach out to me there. And I do offer ongoing, uh, energy healing Q&A uh, group uh, Zoom workshops that are complimentary 
for people to come in. And we do, um, I do an energy healing, clearing and blessing at the beginning of those. So I think it's really important for people to just be able to enjoy that and have that moment because they may not know how to clear their own energy and ground their own energy. Um, so that's something that's offered. Um, and then, um, certainly some people do from there do go on to do sessions with me so it's a series of three sessions which includes past life regression and i also have a podcast which is wakingupspiritually.com and people are so welcome to visit that um, there's no cost and there's over 50 um, episodes there with lots of uh, tips and techniques and tools and meditations. I co-host it um, with my friend Greg Kirk. And it's just great fun to get to bounce things off each other. And we occasionally have guests on there, too. Nice. Well, thank you so much for coming onto the show today and for sharing your story. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you for everything that you're doing. And thank you for having me as your guest. Thank you. And thank you for watching, everybody. Much light from the U.S. and Norway. Bye-bye.